Hi, uh, I'm Garrett Levin, the President and CEO of DEMA. Welcome to our exciting panel, Streaming and Discovering Indie Music in 2021. Uh, I'm joined by some uh, wonderful colleagues and uh, folks throughout the industry who I'll let introduce themselves and we'll jump into just chatting. Hey, I'm, hi, I'm Marissa Fair. I work at uh, Sirius and Pandora. I head up all of our rock and alternative initiatives with labels and artists on the Pandora side. Hi, I'm Madeline Nelson, CEO at Heads Music. It's a boutique music company. We handle label services, distribution, and also artist management. Hi, I'm Richard James Burgess. I'm president and CEO of A2IM, which is the American Association of Independent Music. And we represent uh, independent labels and many other organizations in the independent sector. Well, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to, to chat with you all. We're here to talk about this very exciting topic of kind of how indie music and streaming services work together, the kind of world we live in now with respect to access to indie music. Uh, my organization represents the leading streaming services in the world, including uh, Marissa's company. Um, and, you know, I, this, this came about because Richard, you and I were talking about things that we could talk about and things that we could work on together and the idea of of, you know the the ways in which streaming has opened up the uh, the indie market has led has served as this discovery engine um, for for music for fans for creators um, is a really exciting topic. Um, we spent a lot of time out there. Uh, talking about uh, streaming and the economics of streaming and kind of how many people subscribe to streaming. But this is about like how people find music on streaming and really excited to have Madeline and, and Marissa here to talk about it from the kind of, you know, boots on the ground perspective of how uh, exciting indie music makes its way to people. Um, Richard, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about kind of from where you sit, just kind of what the landscape looks like. And then we've got some exciting data to share about um, kind of how, how how streaming is used to discover music. Right, thank you. Yes, I mean, look, I, I, I've been in this business my whole life and, uh, you know, I've, I've been through many formats. I mean, it started out, it was all vinyl. Um, and, um, you know, I went through, well, eight track and cassette and everything. But what I love about this time now is the amount of variety. Um, there's so many different options uh, of ways you can move forward in the industry. And um, from an independent perspective, we're not restricted by shelf space, you know, so b before I used to be, uh, if a startup label was um, trying to get going, they might have difficulty getting their records into stores because stores have limited shelf space. Um, and then with radio, uh, limited uh, airplay options, plus, you know, they're all, um, you know, they're all non-interactive. So you, you listen to what somebody else is choosing for you, which is sometimes nice, you know, and we, we you know, I know we've, We've, we've carried that model over into streaming as well in the sense of the uh, non-interactive streams um, that we have and then the semi-interactive streams like Pandora and, um, you know, Sirius, which is non-interactive. Um, you know, and, and those can be good too because you've got somebody curating the, you know, the, the, the lists for you and you find stuff that way. But I know for me, I, 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 I like to listen to new stuff all the time. And um, so I constantly scour the internet for recommendations and my friends and everything. And then I literally pull the stuff up, you know, from a streaming service and, and listen to it. So, you know, I, I listen to massive amounts of new music and the evidence is in the independent sector that um, people that like independent music tend to listen to a lot more music because you have to go through a lot of stuff to find the things you really like. So um, I, I think this is a very exciting time. Not to say there aren't problems, there are always problems, especially when you, you get any shift in technology, you know, some people win and some people lose. And, uh, you know, we, one of the reasons we exist is to try to keep the, the playing field level. But I do think um, there are a huge amount of advantages with streaming. Well, why don't we dig into some data and then we can uh, talk with Madeline and Marissa about like how it actually works day to day when you've got a, a recording artist and you've got a, a service and how, how we get this music to, to people. So uh, let me just share my screen and we will see what's... So, 
So um, we partnered with uh, Music Watch, which is kind of the leading survey of uh, kind of consumer behavior with uh, respect to, to music listening. And, and this is the, the first time some of this data is being shared uh, and really looking at mm. kind of how um, discovery works um, and, and who discovers music and where they discover it. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not one of these people who really likes walking through every single point on a PowerPoint, but, but you can see some of the, the main takeaways here, which is that um, there are people who are, there are tens of millions of people who invest a lot of time discovering new artists and music. And the overwhelming majority of them are people who are on uh, streaming platforms, who are listening on streaming, spending a huge amount of time doing so. Um, and they're doing so kind of in, instead of choosing other ways to listen to music. And I, this is this is kind of a, a you know really relevant data point. Discovery is a primary reason why they're paying for those subscriptions, why they're spending time on those streaming services. It's the opportunity to find new music. Um, and those, you know, this is a it, it, Richard. You made the point that that um, the data shows that indie listeners um, listen to a lot more music. It turns out that music discoverers also spend more money on music, um, which of course is you know an important component of the music business is how much money the fans actually spend. Absolutely. So. Um, these are this kind of digs into some of the other elements. Uh, you know, people are are discovering new music, but they're also listening and rediscovering music, finding stuff. You know, but this is this goes to your point, Richard, about some of the unlimited shelf space and the the aspects of streaming that change how we listen to music. I still have in my closet in my house my binders full of CDs, and if I wanted to play something for my kids that like means a lot lot to me and that a, a moment sparks where I'm like oh you have to hear this song I would you know I would have to dig through those CDs to find it instead I can you know go on to to, to one of the numerous streaming services that I uh, use and I can find it pretty pretty easily and so I think um, I think that's a really interesting point we I tend to think of discovery as like finding new stuff but sometimes it's about finding the stuff you forgot you knew before it's very true. I had a shocking moment in the early 2000s when I said to my then 13 year old son, um, you know, you really have to hear this. And I ran down to my where my CD collection was to get it. And as I was running down the stairs, I heard it coming out of his computer. <laughs> and I realized my life was not ever going to be the same again. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, there's also uh, the data we got from Music Watch also kind of divides up um, and looks at some of the dem demographic differences. Um, you know, I think somewhat unsurprisingly, we kind of intuitively know that new music discoverers probably skew younger. But I, I think there's a, a fascinating element, particularly on this like rediscovery idea of the kind of older fans and how older fans are engaging with music in a way that, you know, they, they kind of there was a, a little bit of a gap. Uh, I, I, I talk about my parents sometimes. I, I love you, mom and dad. Um, they, you know, they, they love music, but they went through a period where, like, I think the last CD my mom bought, the last music she had paid for was a Billy Joel River of Dreams, which is quite some time ago. Um, and they got, not too long ago, they got a smart speaker in their house and now they're streaming subscribers and they're using it to, to listen to things they haven't listened to in a really long time. Um, and it's really awesome to, to see them engage that way. Um, we also see, you know, a lot of kind of, we see some genre specific things. We see kind of streaming being able to, to drive different kinds of genre listening and different kinds of demographic audiences, finding uh, different music that maybe was a little bit harder to find in the past, particularly if you lived outside of certain population centers where like it was harder to get access to, to the music that you might want to listen to. Uh, this breaks down a little bit like kind of how much time they're spending, which, you know, I, 
I know we all probably spend a lot of time listening to music because it's a, it's part mm-hmm. of our, our jobs. Um, but you know, the, the average person out there in the world, they've got a lot of things that are calling on their attention and that are taking their time. And the fact that, you know, music discoverers in particular are spending 14 hours a week doing streaming music yeah. rather than doing something else is really, really remarkable to me and a real testament to kind of the engaging uh, um, uh, uh, experience that they get from that. It's an incredible yeah. statistic. It is. Right. I, think, I think also, you know, what makes music the killer app uh, and the reason why we, we got hit so hard at the beginning, you know, in 1999 with Napster is because you can do it anywhere while you're doing something else. And it's a- uh, Yes. Seems like the best value to me, music. <laughs> yeah, even though I, I listen to other things, I have podcasts and books and stuff. But. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, but it's also interesting to see like how people are then, you know, also spending time doing other things like engaging on video platforms, listening to music on social media. And we're seeing that, you know, I'd love to, as we kind of go forward in, in, in our, in our conversation today, like hear from Madeline about how she view, like how you view like the kind of engagement between social media and streaming and kind of like the holistic ever expanding circles that we see in this space. Um, it's really, it's just an exciting time to be, uh, you know, kind of engaging in, in, in a lot of this innovation and reaching people. It's also it's very, very oh, go ahead, Madeline. Oh, no, no, I just gonna say, no, you're right. It, it, it is a very exciting time. It's, um, I, I, I'm always telling the artists, it's such an exciting time to be an independent artist. Um, and part of what we what we all have talked about before, when we talk about democratization, um, and and you know what the the barriers of entry that no longer exist, um, but even with with those lower barriers of entry for for getting your music out there to the world, um, what you're touching on that connection between the the social media and then those other platforms like right now at this moment um i the, when i talk to the artists that i work with on the label side and on the distribution side even i always want to know you know like not how many followers you have on social media but how many of the people who are following you if it's a hundred people versus ten thousand do all of those hundred people know you have music mm-hmm. can they tell by looking at your pages that you're a musician. That's a really important thing, right? So, so like, who, who are you as an artist? Who are they seeing? Are they engaging with you? Are they sharing? When you post yourself singing or you post a piece of a clip of a new song, how many people are sharing it? Like, you, you need to pay attention to that, right? How many people are saving it? Like, so, so are you are you using that platform to build a true fan base that is then going to follow you over to the streaming services? Um, and I do, I, I don't believe, I know how just how many artists underestimate the importance of that, don't understand the, the real connection um, because you, you can't build a fan base on the streaming service. Mm-hmm. You gotta bring a fan base to the streaming service. And in all the conversations that I've had with the folks who are leading the services, when I'm saying to them, what can I do? You know, What can I send you? Can I send you the marketing plan? They've all said in some different version, they've said the same thing. What you can bring is an audience that's already looking for that artist's <laughs> music. So it's the, the connection is just, it's extremely important. Mm-hmm. And I do, it gets lost. It's many artists don't, still don't understand uh, how important that is. I mean, kind of adding to Madeline's point with the level of accessibility to finding music at this point, I know at least on the tech side of Sirius and Pandora about getting the app available in all kinds of consumer electronics. I mean, we're available in, everything from cars to alarms to Xboxes to refrigerators. So you mm. literally can listen to music at any point in time. And, and the truth is, is that at any moment of your day, whether you're getting a drink of water or you're in your car, you are able to listen to music at this point because of where technology is. So the uh, it's, it's just very interesting to see how much time people are really spending on that because I think people are taking their music with them everywhere that they go. Yeah. 
That's so true, absolutely. And going to Madeline's point, I think, by the way, I, I think it's always been that way in the industry, even when it was back in live, you know, you always had to build your own audience. I mean, you go play a venue, nobody shows up. <laughs> and, right. Uh, it was up to you to bring the audience. So, you know, it's different technology, but basically the same principle. You know, you have to build your own audience and there's no magic bullet. I think that one of the biggest mistakes a lot of our artists make is thinking that, uh, that they could just get on this playlist or if they could just get this, you know, it would all change. And there's no just anything. You went over your audience one, one person at a time, basically one listener at a time. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And you've, you've got, you know, some of the services are doing a beautiful job at sharing um, information with the artists. So, you know, you've got these dashboards now that you can look at and you can see where your fans are. And this helps to inform many things. It helps to inform how you do your targeting when you're doing your advertising on social media. It helps to inform when we get back to it where um, people might actually come out to see you perform, it helps mm -hmm. to inform so many things. So you, you also, you've got information there when you do hit the, the services, but again, you, you're, the, you're the one who's bringing those people there. So when you look at how, again, because the barriers of interest are so low, you look at how much music there is now for, for people to try and sort through and the reason why people are listening for such a long time. And, you know, you get frustrated because you're not making these playlists. And you just have to think about just how much music there is for the folks at the services to have to sort through and, you know, how, even when it's just algorithmic, how much music there is to choose from. So it, it will always come back to doing the work of bringing an audience with you to these platforms. Because if you've got that audience, then you're more likely to, to get into those, those playlists, the algorithmic, all of it, because there's more people listening to your music and the services don't miss that. They can't miss that, that's real. Yeah, I think uh, Madeline, you've touched on something really interesting here with the with that access to the data and the, the analytics behind it. And it, it it seems to me like you could say that that you come with your audience, and then streaming can serve the services can serve in in when the when the kind of conditions are right as almost a force multiplier for that, right? Because they allow right. to do it, to take that audience that you've put in the work, as Richard said, that has always been a part of this industry of kind of getting people to like your music and, and be a fan of you. And then this, the, 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 the innovations of the services have allowed for that connection to be, the magnitude of that connection to be multiplied and, and kind of it becomes this, you know, um, th there's a momentum behind it, right? But it, right. It, it right. Can't, it's not just a question of, okay, I'm on, I'm on a streaming service. I'm, I've made it, like here, here we go. <laughs> I mean, as the streaming service president, I couldn't agree more with you. And honestly, it, it, if everyone had the kind of intel and uh, knowledge that Madeline had to have that understanding, it would, it would make things a lot easier. We always say, you know, we can lead you to the water, but you've got to drink it because we're going to give you every tool possible, but we're not going to build an audience for you just out of nowhere. You know, we have a lot of right. people who, who will come to us with a song and say, it's a, it's a hit. And we're like, yeah, it's a great song, but we need, we're, we're a piece of the pie as far as your marketing is concerned. You know, we're not the whole pie, which is um, definitely something we reiterate constantly to a lot of these teams, especially in the, in the independent space where you are really truly building an audience one by one. And we want to help you build that audience as much as we can but there's only so much that we can do, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think that it's a hit thing. I used to hear that all the time. <laughs> and I go, it's a hit. No, it's a hit when it's in it's the a hit. <laughs> when it's in the top 10, it's a hit. When it's not, yeah. it's not a hit. <laughs> a when song. an artist tells me a song is a hit now, I ask them, show me the millions of people that told you so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's dig through a couple more slides and then we'll, we'll like yeah. we'll put ourselves back on the, on the big screen and we'll, we'll talk about yeah. it. Um, 
Yeah, th this is really about, it, it's, a, it's a similar version of the, the last slide that kind of shows it in graphical form, the time that, that people are spending, particularly the discoverer demographic of like what, the, what they're doing with their, their time um, spent listening. And you can see that it, it really does, um, you know, the, the music streaming is the highest music on social media is right there. And then you get into the, some of the, the smaller categories. Um, this is a really interesting slide. We touched on this right at the beginning. Um, and it, it's about kind of how the how new music discoverers engage with the broader music business um, and and looking at kind of per capita expenditures from from 2019 and, and showing that that for the new music discoverers, um, it's it's worth you know two hundred dollars across the primary music revenue streams compared to one hundred and forty five dollars for kind of the general population. Obviously, you know, a big chunk of that we see it is from the live sector. And, you know, mm -hmm. we all know kind of how hard that sector has been hit during the pandemic. We all understand. I think this drives home to some degree just how vital that component is to the, a healthy ecosystem for the music industry, yeah. how hard it is to replace. You take that chunk out of either of those graphs and it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different business and we've seen that over the last year. Um, and I think we are, we are all uh, you know, hopeful and doing what we can to try to get us back to that safely. Um, but it has also been, you know, it, it, without, it, it, it helps frankly that we've got those purple lines there too, those boxes on the streaming subscriptions, those boxes yeah. on you know, other kinds of, of spending that you know, at, at another time we might not have seen uh, if we were in the midst of this kind of uh, pandemic. So I, you know, it's, it is interesting to see it, that we're seeing that new music discoverers are spending more time listening to music, and as a result, they're spending more time spending money. On, or spending, they are spending more money on music. I don't know if they spend time spending money, but they are spending money on it, uh, and that that's pretty virtuous. And, and we want to make sure that they kind of stay engaged there. Um, this is just kind of a breakdown of some of the reasons people subscribe to, um, to streaming services, engage on streaming services. And you'll see that at the, at the top of it is discovering new artists or new music from favorite artists, which, you know, mm -hmm. is, is kind of one of those superpowers of, of the, the platforms that they allow for that, whether it's new or rediscovery. Um, and then you can see that, that this kind of gets into we returning to our theme about social media and how social media in kind of forms part of this, this uh, circle here, what folks are doing with social media or apps for that kind of new music discoverer um, uh, cohort um, and seeing that they watch other videos on something like TikTok. They subscribe to a music or artist YouTube or Vivo channel, right? They're, they're following music artists on a streaming. Like th these are the things that they're doing to go to the, the point that we were just talking about a little bit ago, Madeline, about like you come with your audience and then you get that force multiplication effect when like when your audience helps drive someone new to yeah. that, that, that song and that artist and like how it all just kind of keeps spinning and spinning and spinning until yep. kind of you've, you've maximized your potential there. Yep. Uh, and this is just a, a quick shout out again to Music Watch. Uh, thanks to them for, for sharing this data with us. It comes from their uh, annual music study uh, and their, their audio census. Uh, and we, I, like, I can't thank them enough for, for sharing some of this data with us. I think it's really exciting. Uh, hopefully we can, we can see even more data coming out uh, from them around kind of how discovery works and trying to get even more granular about what people are discovering. Uh, and I'm gonna stop my screen sharing so we can uh, back to talking. Hi. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> so uh, that, it was great to talk to you. That. So Marissa and Madeline, I would love to kind of turn it over to you both a little bit. And we got into this a little bit about um, kind of your your perspectives from the service side, your perspectives, Madeline, from the, the, the label side. But I'm curious, like how it works day to day, um, how, you know, for, for Marissa, like how, how it works when, a, when an artist or artist rep comes to you, um, what your interactions are like with the indie sector. Madeline, what it's like when you've got, so, when you've got someone you're really excited about, when you've got that person with that fan base, when you've got, when you've mm -hmm. done that work, what, what comes next? Like what, how do we, how do I, as the, you know, the listener end up 
finding it on on my playlist or you know in my uh, in in my algorithm or or in front of me. Yeah, yeah. Marcy, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, when it comes to you know my day to day is really um, I speak with labels and artists and managers every day. So I have a, a plethora of labels that I speak to weekly, bi weekly, monthly, depending on what's going on. You know, some labels only have. Uh, 10 artists that are signed and there are only three in cycle or one in cycle at a time. And then you also have distribution uh, companies that are, have thousands that are in cycle. So it, it really ranges all over the place. Um, but the truth is, is that uh, what the real crux of it is having these relationships with these labels and managers, um, having them understand the way that we like to have music delivered to us to listen to, or um, different highlights that can actually uh, move the needle on our platform. So there's a mutual understanding of what the platform is and what we can do for them and what they can do for us and, and all of that. And then specifically on the Pandora side, we have a suite of tools that we offer to these artists that can help them yeah. push forward on the platform. Madeline's incredibly uh, well-versed in a lot of that and has used it a bunch. But um, when I was talking about leading you to the water and drinking it. In this case, it's very much about our AMP tools and um, embracing the platform to help you. So it's building your audience and uh, using what we have as audio messages to talk to your audience on the platform that you've built and we've helped you build as well. And then you can, in our case, you can sell tickets and uh, geo-target that. You can sell merchandise. You can basically link out to anything you want besides another streaming service, as you can probably imagine. But um, in our case, it's really about educating our labels and helping them use the tools that we have to amplify any of the music. So that's, that's kind of the day-to-day. -day. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into that, but um, for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Madeline to talk about how she fits into that. <laughs> and so this is a thing from, from my perspective and what I would love um, <clears throat> just labels and 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 artists to really take away from this is so Marissa talks about the day-to-day -day and that little bit that she just talked about is is exactly that it's just a little bit there's so much more to her day-to-day -day. so when you're coming from my perspective what you have to understand is anybody that you're going to reach out to at any one of these services they're hearing, it's one of those things, it was in like a Jay-Z or a Kanye West song where it says there's a million you's, there's only one of me, right? So there's a million of us trying to get Marissa to pay attention to us and to our artists and to what our priorities are. So what I've learned, and I have learned it the hard way, is that what, what I have to do is remember how many of us are coming at that one person and everything that they have to do. And when somebody says to me, use the playlisting tool, use the, the voice note feature, when they start to unpack all of those things that are available to me and avail available to my artists, I go educate myself and I go educate my artists because it's so important to understand that these tools are there for you to utilize. And, and there's like a magic that happens once you do. I have one artist in particular that I started working with at the beginning of 2020. And he came to me with an amazing product, an amazing album that he didn't even know was an album when he came to me. And, um, and with a decent sized audience on social media. And so we put our heads down and we did the work. We used playlisting tools. We used everything we could use on every platform. If one platform has a Google form that you have to just submit for playlisting and it's two weeks before the song is actually gonna go live, you get it done. You, you put the dates on the calendar and you get the work done. So then when you send a note, I can't even explain how I've been told how refreshing it is to get a note from somebody on my side and it's showing, I, I already did this form, I already did this and I'm asking, but would you please also listen to the song and maybe somebody in this other department, it, cause it's like a little, a mix, right? Might consider it for, for what they might look at for playlisting. When you do that, it, you're showing the folks at the services that you do understand how much 
they're doing. You are respecting their time. They're not getting an email from you every week. Um, sometimes they're not even getting it every artist because you know that once you've done the work on, a spe on, on several of the platforms, all you can do is, is really wait. That's really all you can do. Um, but when they're getting it, when you've got like your super big priorities, um, you, you will tend to see some very special things get done. And I, I also don't want anybody to underestimate the importance of building real relationships um, with the folks that you, you want to champion your music. Like all of these things are important. The biggest thing though, the biggest thing is educating the artists, is really, is making them understand, you know, they're not, they're not like messing with you and they're not holding you back and all of those things that you might think because you're not making playlists, but there's, there's work to do. And uh, when you're getting all that information, I get emails from nearly every service about updates, about new features. And what people tend to do is not read those emails. I, you know, maybe I'm a nerd, but I read them. I read them and I start to forward to everybody. Like, here's something you can use. Here's something you should look at. It's all of that is important. Um, so I, I would just love everybody's biggest takeaway just from, from what I'm saying in this moment is to be that, is that you've got to educate the artists and, and from the label perspective, the distribution perspective, you've got to educate yourself. And you really have to understand that the, when you've got one person sitting on the other side of a million of us, um, we respect the time. Um, even getting, getting, getting that email back is a big deal because there's probably a thousand sitting in, in their inbox that day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, see, I have a question for you, Marissa. Because I mean, the independent sector, tends to take quite a long time to promote a record, maybe a year, sometimes two years. Do you have a sense of, of the length of time? Because I think a lot of people don't appreciate how long it takes from inception, you know, for a new artist or even sometimes a new release of an established artist, but certainly a new artist, it takes a long time, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I my, my own professional history is working at independent labels. So I understand, you know, we're working with 18 month campaigns, which I, I come mm -hmm. from a world of appreciating that because I've worked on records that have taken 18 months to hit their ultimate peak. And mm -hmm. then it goes on for another year. And especially in the independent sector, I think it's, it's really beautiful how things don't flip on a dime and these audiences are really building. So when I'm speaking to a label, I want to know how long they've been working on something. I, I take pride in knowing that a label has put effort and time and money into something for a long time. I think it shows dedication by the artist and manager and label that they want to stick with something. And I don't think it, it's not desperate in any way to be with something for six to eight months, because especially when touring is such a big deal in this sector as well, when we can get back to that. I mean, there's there are so many of these artists that get a break on a big tour and the song is, is hitting in that moment. And they might get a sync somewhere and it goes, it goes off. I mean, I, I talk about it with Lord Huron is a really great example. I mean, years after one of their songs came out, it, it got a sync and it just blew up and it, and it changed their whole trajectory on the platform for us. They were already an artist that we were working with in a capacity that they were successful and doing really well, but their audience grew in a mass way, just in that sense. So you need to kind of understand, especially in the world of TikTok now, where there are these songs that came out five years ago that you are that people are discovering, and that idea of rediscovery. I mean, Fleetwood Mac is is even something that could be a new discovery for a lot of people right now. So it's yeah. really just understanding the zeitgeist and seeing what is moving forward and sticking with something. I, I love to stick with something. I think it's really cool to be a part of that story. Um, you know, it's it's. I have that luxury on my side to be able to do that. Yeah, I think that you make a great point about the um, the benefits of a longer campaign. I mean, I know having been a manager in my yeah. career, you know, that it enables you to set up tours, it enables you to plan ahead. 
And although it sort of seems painful at times when you're nine months into an 18 month or two year campaign and you're not there yet and you never quite know, it's not like every day, you know, well, 18 months from now, this is gonna be huge. It's every day you think it might be over, but at the same time, it buys you the time to do all those other things that you need to do. Yeah, true development, which I think, you know, is, is very tough. It's probably the hardest thing to do. I always say it's easier to manage the biggest band in the world than it is to manage an indie artist because you're working your butt <laughs> off, you know? I mean, I truly think that way. It's like, you're just keeping the train on the tracks when it comes to a huge band and when it comes to an indie artist that is building an audience. I mean, you are inventive and you are recreating and you are, you are hitting the pavement, you know? I mean, it's, it's kind of going yep. back to the, the virtual handing out of flyers is kind of what you're doing every day. And you're standing outside the proverbial venue trying to get people to listen to your music and come to your show. It's, it's, it's exhausting. It's tough. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. And you're not, you know, you're not working with the kind of dollars uh, that the, the majors are working with. So you, 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 you have to spread it out. You absolutely have to pace yourself the hardest thing is making artists understand why um, a campaign should last for a certain amount of time or making them understand that just because something didn't like blow up as soon as it got to streaming that there's still tremendous amount of potential if you just stick with it and keep doing the work. And also it's something that you said, Marissa, I think it's so important because it's something that I've been told over and over again by other services as well. They love to see a label stick with something. They love it when you when you don't give them something and then it's not happening. Um, you, you jump to that next song. It's like, I had one person at one of the services tell me, you know how exhausting it is to get a song on this one artist every month. It, I just don't believe the, the label believes in the artist. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought of it that way. I had never thought of it that way. And it, it this was a few years back. It's really informed um, the mm -hmm. amount of time I believe we should spend on, on a song or an album or, or EP or mixtape or whatever, because you do need the people on the other side to believe that you believe in your product and your artists. Madeline, I'm really, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you talked a little bit about um, kind of the tools and stuff that like the most like people who like users of the services aren't necessarily fully aware of like kind of the stuff kind of like under the hood that like creators and, and their representatives get access to. I'm curious, like hearing this discussion, like what role some of those tools play in like helping you kind of stay on that track, stay on that 18 month plan or two year plan and like how you are able as someone working with the, the artist and like committed to seeing that success carry through, like how those play out. Like, I think that's just a really interesting area to, to, to unpack a little bit. Yeah. So uh, let me, I'll start with Pandora. <laughs> um, so I have an artist who is what we call a legacy artist that I, uh, I manage and I distribute uh, his music. His name is Wyclef Sean. And so out of all of the streaming services where I found when I started working with him, he was most popular um, was on Pandora. And um they Pandora has on the on the back end, they have a feature where the artists can record a voice note, like right there inside of this app, they can record a voice note. <clears throat> and it goes out to everybody that has that artist station hmm. on the app. So we were like, if he's got this many people listening on this app, how many people would listen to this voice note? So the very first one he did was like a hundred thousand people. And it was just one of those old moments where like, whoa, there's, here's another way. Like they are literally giving us access to our fans. And so he started doing those things. He would leave one when something new was coming and we would genuinely see results on the back end of, of doing that. Um, there's another sort of SoundCloud where you, your top 50 fans, you're able to message with them. 
So when we understood that information, we shared it with all the artists and the artists started messaging with them. So all of my artists who have merch, they would like message their top 50 artists and let them know, hey, send us your email address and send us your Instagram handle. I'm gonna send you a piece of my merch. Now, when you're the person on the other side, if you are a top 50 listener, you really like this artist. And now this artist messages you and says, hey, I'm gonna send you a piece of my merch. But also when you're on my side, to get that merch, you've now sent me your email. I'm the artist who now has a mailing list. I have people to send my newsletter to, to send my information to when I've got a new song coming out. So the finding these tools on, on these services has been extremely helpful to us. It has helped us build out our mailing list. It has helped us to understand who our fans are, where they live, what excites them. Uh, you know, something simple, when, when Wycliffe would just send a voice note out, like, like a, hey, how you doing? I really love you guys. Um, we get more interaction. When he'd send one about a new product coming, we wouldn't. So what we realized is, mm, these things can't sound like a sales pitch. We've got to like do something different. We've got, you know, so you learn, you use them and you learn, you learn how to interact with your fans. You learn what they like. You learn what will make them give you something for whatever it is you are expecting back from them. Um, and listen, and the more, the more tools we find, um, the more active we get, and the more we get on the back end for utilizing. So I just, I really highly recommend learning them and using them because the truth is for as many people who are staffed at all of the services, there's never going to be enough people that all of us are going to have somebody to talk to every day. So we really got to like learn how to like do all of those things that we hope are going to give us an edge. And if you're paying attention, there's always something new because listen, it's so important for the services. They need us. They need us <laughs> they, just as much as we think we need them. They need us. And so they are going to continue to give us tools that keep us on the platform, but also tools that are going to keep our listeners on the platform. So the more we're engaging with our listeners, the more we understand them, the more we're able to do with them, the more it's keeping both of us. On, on the platform. So they keep giving us tools. It's our job to learn how to use them, how they can benefit us. Well, and the positive thing is those tools are 24 seven as well. And they're often on your cell phone. So, you know, you can, you can do them when you're somewhere doing something, waiting, traveling, whatever you're doing. Not that any of us are traveling much these days, but when exactly. you get back to traveling, um, I, find exactly. that, I find that amazing. I, mean, I was messing around with some dashboards last night late and, you know, Normally, previously in my career, you know, everything had to be done in business hours, or, you know, and, and that's not true anymore. It's it's pretty amazing, I think. I mean, Richard, you, 24 7. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. just mentioned your career. You have had a, like an incredible career. You've done like basically just like about everything in this business. Like, I, I'm curious your perspective on kind of like in the indie music world today compared to you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like where, where are we now? And like, kind of how does streaming fit in into that? I and mean, you just mentioned the tools, those didn't exist when you were a recording artist, right? Like, not at all. No, I mean, I mean, you know, it's like, so, you know, the, the, pro the problem today is that everybody can make a record, but that's also not the problem. It's also a beautiful thing. Cause when I was a kid, you had to get a record deal to make a record, you know? So you got to convince yeah. And then our guy at the record label, and when I was a kid, there were six major record labels and a handful of independents. And, um, you know, so that was where the gatekeepers were. Now, you know, what is I hear something like 600,000 tracks are issued every month, something like that. It's crazy. And, and most of them will not be hugely successful. Um, but at the same time, those people could make the record they wanted to make and they could, they could get it out there and, you know, they have a shot, which is great. But I think, um, you know, more than anything, um, so the 90s is, is, is a good example because it immediately preceded the digital era. And um, I had a label then, I was managing then. And, um, you know, we, we had very limited choices, really. I mean, we had to go to radio. Radio was difficult and it became more difficult when the consolidation happened after 90, 
9060 regulation. Um, and, you know, if people think the playlists are hard to get on today, well, try getting on radio playlists when there's your only <laughs> options. Um, really, really difficult. And then the other thing is radio doesn't pay you, you know, so, um, you know, with digital, you've got the double benefit with streaming, but, um, you know, not only are you getting um, out there and you're, you're finding your fan base and you're expanding your fan base, but you're also getting paid for every, every stream. So um, there's a lot of things that are different about it these days. And I think the, the other thing about, you know, being in the streaming landscape that's different is we sort of move from pretty much an albums uh, uh, market, which was the, the 90s. Now, now the independents are very strong in albums. Independents like to make albums. But the bottom line is you don't have to make an album. If you're trying to get started, you can make one track and put it up. You don't even have to make B-sides. We used to have to make B-sides for every track we made. So there's so many things that, I mean, I don't mean to sound, you know, like an old fogey, although I guess I am at this point, but, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm excited by this because I, I, see, I see, you know, like I said before, there's, there's always downsides, there's always winners and losers, there's always better ways of doing things and worse ways of doing things and you can compare the two. But at the same time, the amount of options we have today seem to me to be liberating for independents. And, and then you've got, you know, the new independents, the kids, you know, who were born, you know, 17 years ago, 18, 20 years ago, whatever, they're, they're born into this. So it's like, it's just second nature for them um, how to work all these different, um, uh, you know, facets of the industry now, like TikTok controller and, you know, the various, the dashboards, you know, that's all, you know, Sony PlayStation stuff, right? It's, it's, yep. it's you know, part of the whole game, gaming sort of uh, world. So, I, you know, I, I see this as very positive is what I'm, what I'm saying. I think that, um, you know, the variety more than anything, the amount of options, in fact, you can make a record on your laptop, you know, the laptop I'm speaking to you on is more powerful in terms of recording technology than the finest studios in the world when I was, producing and I, and I worked in the best studios. So, you know, you look at it in, in aggregate like that, it's quite stunning where we are, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It is, it is. Alan, do you have a, I'm curious, like, do you have a perspective on the, on the creation side of it? You know, when you're, when you hear, when artists are coming to you, to, to Richard's point, like the fact that you can like make something on a, on a computer that has like, that's more powerful in terms of recording technology than stuff even just, you know, two decades ago. Like, what are you seeing from your perspective at the, at the label when, in terms of how, how that creation is happening and the technology, mm -hmm. technological innovation there? Listen, when I was a young manager, okay, we were working in the studios. Like if we went in one that didn't have one of those big giant SSL boards, we're like, mm, <laughs> they don't even have a great studio. And I do, I have artists now who, no kidding, I have one artist and he's he's in that age range that Richard was talking about, he's 20 years old and everything gets recorded in his bedroom. The entire studio is set up in his bedroom. I have one, another artist, we, Wyclef created a song called Distance um, when the pandemic got started on his iPhone. He, he, he didn't have any other choice. Like we were so isolated in the beginning and uh, our engineer at the time had gotten really, really sick at the beginning of this, this pandemic. And so Wyclef made, he made the song on his iPhone and was sending files back and forth now he has since gotten ridiculously computer savvy. That's one thing also that this has done for a lot of, of artists. Um, they've really learned to do the work that they would depend on engineers to do. Many artists I know have that, that you know, I have signed in and just others around the business. Um, but it's, it's been beautiful for me, honestly, to see how innovative artists have gotten. It's, it was, it was, exactly almost 10 years ago when um, the, the head of the label I was working at said that we didn't need to talk about the Spotify numbers in the meeting because it wasn't going to mean much. That was, that was only 10 years ago, guys. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, I'm looking at artists with some of the platforms you can submit the music right there from your phone. Some of the distribution services, you can do that. And it's just beautiful 
to see how innovative young people and, and some not so young people have gotten with, with uh, what's happening now um, on, on, on music discovery. It's, I like it, I love it, I think it's fun. And I think it's fun to, at my age, try to keep up with it and, and depend on these young people to keep me informed, uh, keep me cool, whatever we, we wanna say. But when they learn it, I ask them to teach me, they're more than happy to. I think it's fun for me not to be the one, it's fun for them that I'm not always the one teaching. Uh, I, I, but I've seen it all. I, I've seen full on recording done on an iPhone. It, the, the, even the mastering part of it get done through an app on the phone, submitted to the services, and then huge, big uh, television interviews being done about that song and how it got recorded in that way. So it, it's just beautiful and it's fun to watch. And, um, and it go, goes back to what this whole conversation is about, understanding discovery mm. uh, and, and figuring out how to get your music done by, by any means. It's, I, I love it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, change is the only constant thing in life at this point. Yeah. If, you, if you don't, if you don't love change, you know, <laughs> I don't know, what, I don't know how you're gonna handle it in the next twenty years. But exactly. the fact that Madeline, that it was just ten years ago, right? I mean, like how yeah. the speed of change right now is absolutely remarkable. Um, just, sure. And like it's 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 just exponentially changing every day and it's still like a very i mean it, you know we, we we streaming for all of its centrality to the to the industry now it's like still relatively new right and like that that yep. a lot of room for further innovation a lot of room for for new tools new exciting things and i i love how excited we all are it's really great to see yeah. at least on on our side i mean i know when i came on to pandora this was five or six years ago at this point but i remember they were saying to us a lot about how um we are trying to create a middle class for musicians where it's creating a space that people mm. can get their music out there to anyone um, and make it as equal opportunity as possible. I mean, I'm sure you can't really use exactly equal opportunity because we are in a space where there are labels and distributors and marketing teams yeah. and money and all of that stuff. But um, the truth is, is that the crux of it, what I think uh, the mentality, at least where I'm coming from, is is very much trying to give as much of an equal opportunity as we can. It's, uh, I never want to discriminate against something that's been made in a bedroom. And I also don't want to be the last person to play it either. There's, there's that fear in my head that I'm going to be behind. So if you're trending and you're cool and you're everywhere and everyone's listening to you and I don't know about it, that makes right. me look bad too, you know? So so there's, it's on both sides that it's not just getting into our world. Like we got to get into yours because the power is in the artist's hands a lot of, the, especially in the last year where like, I can't go to shows. I can't go to listening sessions. I can't do any of that stuff. So I'm scouring the internet trying to make sure I'm not behind. So it's, it's yeah. very much there. Well, that's, we're almost out of time. Why don't we take our last couple of minutes to help people discover something, right? Like to, to like do do some of that. So like if, if folks are comfortable, like like sharing an indie artist that they think people should know more about or um, would love to, to put in a pitch for, I'll, I'll go first and I cheated because I picked two. Uh, so one is a <laughs> singer songwriter named Sean Rowe, who's based up in upstate New York and does foraging and stuff, but is like a, has an amazing baritone. And I've become kind of a cheesy dad who really likes songs about parenthood and he has this amazing song called i'll follow your trail which is like one of the best songs i've ever heard about being a parent um and then my second one is one of my best friends in the world her name is bridget kaylin k-a-e-l-i-n and she can play the musical saw and the accordion and has and can yodel and like writes beautiful Ooh. like kind of americana bluegrassy songs and and does it from louisville kentucky so those are my two plugs wow i have to plug price um, I was going to say, Madeline, this is young, your time. Get them all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, young, a young Black man who uh, we put this album of his out only a few months ago. He hit a million streams on one platform, almost a million on another. Every significant playlist um, on, on Spotify. 
absolutely incredible, is an artist with a message. People liken him to Kendrick Lamar, but it's very obvious he's not trying to sound like Kendrick Lamar. He is incredible and we're already about to put his next album out. And um, I think I have a, a bunch in my head and I'm probably gonna get upset with myself later for not naming more, but um, I've been really loving Claude from Secretly Canadian. Binky has been a big one for me in the last couple of years on uh, Caroline Peachtree Rascals has been really cool to be a part of. Um, you know, there's a bunch, there's a bunch in there and I will get upset with myself. I'm gonna remember like five to 10 artists later. I'm gonna be upset I didn't name, but there's too much <laughs> there. So I've been, I, I've been going through a, a jazz, I go, through, I cycle through genres. Actually one of the things when I used to have XM, when Sirius XM was separate and uh, from my car and every, you know, because you have so many stations, I used to sort of spend a week listening to one station and um, and different genres, so I like to keep up. So the past couple of weeks, I've been back into jazz, which has been interesting. And I discovered a couple of artists. One is uh, an artist called Aaron Deal, D-I-E-H-L, who's a piano player. And it's really not the kind of music I normally like, um, but it's just very beautiful. And, and, and I was really struck by it. But I was also, and it's probably not very many people are gonna share my taste in this, but I have a, a real appetite for avant-garde jazz. And there's an, an artist, and I'm not gonna be able to pronounce the name properly, um, called Rudresh Mah Mahanthapa, I think his name is. He's an Indian, he lives in Manhattan, um, sax player, he plays his avant-garde jazz, he's an amazing band. I'm a drummer and the drummer is incredible. And, um, uh, you know, so, I think, you know, and I thought about it before I came on, I thought I, maybe I should pick something more mainstream. And I thought, well, I'm probably gonna be the only one picking picking these kinds of things. And I think what it does is it points up how this is something that's very special about the streaming world is that, you know, you can occupy your own little corner, right? Your own little space. Yep, so, great. Well, this was awesome. I, I'm so glad we did this. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time to-, to Thank to you for having us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thanks for all the organizing and just Sally Rose as well. And right. Josh.